Brilliant. Okay, guys. Um, well, welcome to Friday afternoon teaching. I am going to talk to you about what I think is one of the most important parts of intensive care, and I think it's often slightly overlooked as part of training. And probably as trainees, you get sort of less um, information about it and less exposure to it. Um, I'm Kaz, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the ICU and ECMO consultants from Glenfield, and I've been running our ECMO follow-up clinics for, oh God, almost a decade now. And I think that not only is it quite fascinating, but it's also really important to know what happens to our patients a bit further down the line, because really at the end of the day, intensive care is not about creating survivors, it's about creating survivors with a quality of life they find acceptable. Um, I would encourage any trainees, if they can, to spend some time in the IC follow-up clinics. Um, it gives you a really good idea of not only kind of the, the outcomes for your patients, um, but also, certainly for me as a clinician, I think it's helped my practice. I think it's certainly trained me to be a bit more patient when I'm dealing with patients, um, especially those that are delirious. Um, and certainly I've taken stuff that I've learned from my patients during follow-up and use that to try and kind of improve my ICU treatment acutely. So, you know, and even trying to sort of humanize, if you like, the intensive care unit. So we've got about 45 minutes, although we are starting a little bit late. Let me turn myself because I do have a bit of a habit of wittering on. Um, and over the next 45 minutes or so, this is what we're going to go over. We're going to talk about what the post-intensive care syndrome or PICS, everything is an acronym, right? What, what is it? Why is it important? Why is it important both to you guys as healthcare workers looking after them? Why is it important to our patients and their families? Um, a little bit about how common a problem it is. Um, a bit about can we do anything about it? Can we improve our long-term outcomes for our patients when we're looking after them in the short term during their acute illness? I'm going to touch on what happens to the families. It's a bit of a can of worms, and we'll get to that when we get to that. And then finally, and depending on sort of time, I'm going to just tell you a few stories of stuff that I have heard from my intensive care patients when they've come back to see me at follow-up. Um, this is a bit schmaltzy, not all superheroes wear capes, some wear PPE. Um, but this whole not all heroes wear capes thing is quite often applied to healthcare. And certainly I wouldn't think that we're heroes, but we sometimes go to heroic efforts to try and save lives and improve quality of life for our patients. But everyone has a dirty secret. And I think that PICS, post-intensive care syndrome, has until quite recently been our dirty secret in critical care. And partly that's because until quite recently, we just didn't ask. We didn't follow up our patients. Um, after they left the intensive care units. We celebrated the fact that they'd survived and we discharged them to the ward, but we didn't actually know what happened to them afterwards. And if you look at the vast majority of critical care research, it focuses on short-term, so 30-day mortality, or, or what they term long-term, medium or longer term, which is 90-day mortality. And I think if you ask the patients, so we can do this, and we think you're more likely than not to be alive at a month. Is that really an outcome there? I mean, survival is, is definitely crucial. They want to know whether they're going to live or die. But actually, the majority of people who come to intensive care do survive. It's about 80%, just under that from the latest sort of ICNARC data. So the vast majority of our patients do survive their critical care stay. So for that 80% of all of our admissions, really, what would be more important to them? You know, they're going to ask, well, I'm going to be alive at a month. Will I be alive at six months? Will, will I be alive at five years? What will my life look like? Will I be able to go back to work, go back to school, go back to my own home? Will I have ongoing problems? Will I need to come back into hospital again? What will my life look like? Will I be able to return to a quality of life that I find acceptable? And really, until recently, we didn't have a lot of data to answer that because we didn't follow these patients up and we didn't ask the questions. Um, when we did start following them up and critical care follow-up clinics sort of started towards the end of the 90s and have really taken off kind of in the last 10 years, um, the, the results are quite sobering. Um, let's talk a bit about what is the post-intensive care syndrome. So this is what happens to critical care survivors. And this is probably the best description, the best definition. So new or worsening impairments in physical, cognitive and or mental health 
arising after critical illness and persisting beyond discharge in the acute care setting. And the term itself was coined in 2010, so not that long ago. Um, there was a meeting of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, um, and it was lots of stakeholders, so clinicians and rehab physicians and patients um, and sort of hospitals and, and um, involved in other critical care um, staff. And they realised, because we started realising from following up these patients, that actually there's lots of problems that occur after critical care. And the reason that they gave it a term, so a syndrome, so PICS, was more so we could use that term to do further investigation, to find out what it was that caused it, what made it worse, if anything could make it better, and to really put in place things like rehab pathways and follow up so that patients really maximise their recovery. So PICS can be divided into three main domains, as we say. So physical problems, cognitive problems, and then psychological problems or mental health problems. And what I've listed there are the sort of common ones um, that people talk about. So in the physical domain, we'll talk a little bit more about weakness. We've all seen pretty weak patients on the intensive care unit. And um, we'll talk, we'll focus on that in a little bit. Um, fatigue. Now, you can start seeing why some of these things are difficult to measure because actually a lot of these things are patient reported. So fatigue is sort of an overwhelming tiredness that isn't related to physical exertion, that actually um, interferes with sort of um, daily life. But the only person that can say how fatigued they are is the person. You can't measure fatigue so much. You can use surveys to try and work out levels of fatigue, but it's a personal thing that we experience that rather than something that, that can be easily measured with a test, unlike weakness, where we can do measurements. Um, shortness of breath or dyspnea. And again, dyspnea is a sensation that only a patient can tell you. So dyspnea is feeling short of breath. So I can tell you whether your pulmonary function test is abnormal, or you have a chest x-ray that's abnormal, or your oxygen levels are low, or you can't walk as far in six minutes as you used to before your critical care stay. But only you can tell me if you feel breathless, and that's what dyspnea is. Um, it's much easier to measure alive versus dead. So alive versus dead is a binary yes, no question. So it's very easy to say X amount of people are alive at 30 days or 90 days or at the end of their ICU stay. It's much harder to say, to say what percentage of people are suffering from fatigue, are suffering from dyspnea. We'll concentrate a bit on the cognitive stuff, and this I think is probably the scariest bit of ICU, because ICU is definitely bad for your brain. And I'll tell you about a, a, a big study that's sort of important that tells us some answers here. And then we'll talk a bit about the psychological stuff and the three main conditions um, that people suffer after surviving a critical illness, are anxiety, depression, and then in the most sort of extreme versions, post-traumatic stress disorder. Why is this important? Why is this important to patients and their families? Well, this is pretty obvious, I think. Um, so the bad stuff that can happen to you after intensive care, these problems can be profound. They can last for months or even years. We're only really now starting to realize how long people have these impairments for after critical care. And all of these things can negatively impact on daily functioning, their quality of life, whether, as we were saying before, they're able to go back to work, are they be able to go back to school, are they, be able, are they able to go back to their own home, do they have to go into residential care or nursing care? And there's also a big impact, not only from a personal level, but also a societal level of future need for healthcare input. And there's been um, a big sort of study on more than 3.9 million ICU survivors, most of which came from Europe, um, well, most of which came from North America and from Europe, that, that accounted for over 90% in this cohort. And they looked at readmission rates, so readmission after intensive care, and over half of these patients were readmitted within 12 months. So that's a huge burden on healthcare services through the world. Why is knowing about post-intensive care syndrome really important for you guys? Um, well, that's because we make the decisions about who should come to intensive care. We make the decisions about when you come to intensive care, should we you know, limit the degree of organ support that we give you? Should we you know, put, put limits into care? 
Um, and even for those who aren't involved in intensive care but might be involved um, in anaesthetics, for example, you know, that the high risk surgical patients, the patients that are likely to come to intensive care post-op. So this is relevant um, for these patients as well. It's also really important that we can tell our patients, we can warn our patients about some of the problems that they might face, you know, what they need to look out for, and most importantly, where they can get help if these problems occur. It's really important from the post-op sort of, uh, sorry, the post-ICU follow-up. So, you know, setting up or improving the clinic so we are targeting the problems that people have and we're providing the support that they need to maximise their recovery. Um, I talked about this a little bit before, but I think it's just really important knowing what the longer term problems are so we can try and optimise what we do in the acute settings. And then finally, it's really important to, to listen to our patients, listen to our patients' stories, listen, listen to what is most important to them, what matters most to them, and take some of these things and try and humanise the intensive care unit. I'm sure we can all remember the first time as a junior doctor that we stepped onto the ICU. And it's pretty terrifying. You know, there's lots of machines that are going to beep. There's lots of monitors. You don't really know what a lot of the machines do. You certainly don't know how to, um, you know, how to titrate the machines. You certainly don't know how a ventilator works when you first see it. Um, it's really noisy. There's lots of people. The patients look really sick. There's lots of tubes coming out of every orifice. Um, you know, sometimes they look very swollen or they might be jaundiced or they, you know, these are clearly very ill patients on life support machines. And that's pretty terrifying as a, as a junior doctor. Now, just imagine how that would feel if you are a relative and the person you love most in the world is in that bed attached to all those machines that you don't understand with the alarms going off and flashing monitors. And then try and put yourself into the place of the patient who wakes up with unable to speak because they've got a tube in their throat potentially, you know, often really weak. So they think, God, have I been paralyzed? What on earth has happened here? Not being able to understand what's happened. A lot of the things are painful. I mean, even having drips in are quite uncomfortable. Now sort of multiply that to art lines and central lines, and endotracheal tubes and catheters and bowel management systems and chest drains and everything else that you might need when you're in intensive care. The patients often can't see the monitors because they're usually behind their head. So they can just hear these alarms. And it's amazing the noise levels that we have in our intensive care units. And some of the alarms that we hear, I mean, for example, the NG tube, the NG feed, it has a really, really loud, really worrying alarm, which is just either I'm a bit blocked or I'm almost running out of feed. Now, we as clinicians know that that's not really that important you know it's an ng feed if it's running out we'll just change the bag and that's not a problem imagine as a patient you hear that you hear that alarm going off behind your head you think oh god what's that is that something really bad with me am i dying what's going on now so intensive care units are pretty terrifying places but if we're scared just think of how our patients and our family feel so how common is it so I want to concentrate a little bit on this paper, because the problem with measuring anything post-critical care is that we often don't have a baseline of what people were like before they came into critical care, particularly if they've come as an emergency. So all the emergency surgical or medical patients, we often haven't done sort of a battery of tests before they come in. We don't know what their cognitive level is. We don't know what their functioning is, although we might have a good idea of things like, um, you know, their their baseline functioning, their exercise tolerance. It's really difficult then to know what's a new problem, what's an exacerbated problem, and what actually is just the underlying condition that, that brought them in in the first place. But these guys, so um, this is a study from the Netherlands. It's a multi-hospital study, so there's four different hospitals. Um, they did it quite recently, so between 2016 and 2019, um, and they tried to find out whether uh, what the new symptoms were, so what, what new PIC symptoms these patients had at a year post-critical care. They looked at all adult patients, and the way they did that is they did a baseline questionnaire. So for the elective surgical patients, they gave them this questionnaire at pre-op assessment, and then they asked them to fill it out a couple of days before their operation. And then for the emergency medical or the emergency surgical patients, 
um, they got them to fill out uh, these questionnaires whilst they were on the intensive care unit. And if the patients were unable to fill them out, then their next of kin, their proxies were off to fill them out. Although looking at it, actually the majority of the questionnaires were filled out by the patients themselves, even in the sort of emergency admissions. And it was a questionnaire that looked at sort of lots of things to get a baseline. And then the same questionnaire um, with a few modifications was basically repeated at 12 months. And they looked at lots of the things that might influence how your, uh, your outcomes from critical care. And they looked at new sort of post-intensive care syndrome um, problems. So they looked at frailty, they looked at fatigue, they looked at new or worsening physical problems, they looked at anxiety and depression, they looked at the post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress symptoms, they looked at patients' cognitive health, and then they looked at quality of life. It's a pretty big study, so uh, they had um, almost 2,400 patients that completed the 12 months, so it was a good sort of uh, number of patients. Um, interestingly, going back to that what's new and what was pre-existing, with the pre-existing health questionnaires, about 60% of these patients um, claimed that they were fatigued at baseline. So that's a pretty common thing that happens to everyone. And about 20%, so one in five, said that they had underlying anxiety, and that's to start with. So these uh, authors, when they were looking at it, were specifically looking at new problems. And again, the results were pretty sobering. So new problems that weren't there at baseline, they found that 58% of the medical ICU survivors, two thirds of the urgent surgical ICU survivors, and just over 40% of the elective surgical ICU survivors had a new PICS problem. Um, looking at those sort of different, you know, the frailty, fatigue, physical problems, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, cognitive health and quality of life. Um, most of them only had one new problem. A few of them had several. Um, they looked at um, quality of life and physical outcomes. And actually, they found they were worse at 12 months for all of the emergency admissions, more so in the emergency surgical than the emergency medical. But interestingly, for the elective surgical patients, those two metrics, so physical health and quality of life, were actually better. More worryingly, and we'll talk about how ICU is bad for your brain a bit more later on, they found that all of the patients, so whether they were elective or emergency, had a worsening of their cognitive health at 12 months post-ICU. Um, they also looked at that whole, can I return to work, which is quite an important question for our patients. And they found that about half of the emergency admissions and about one third of the elective admissions had had a change in their work circumstances. So they were either on long term sick leave, they'd reduced their hours, they'd retired or they'd left their job because of health reasons. So it has a pretty big impact on, on working life. Um, unsurprisingly, the strongest predictor of how um, bad these sort of scores were at 12 months was their underlying health. So those who were more frail, who had more underlying problems to start with, were the ones who were faring worse at 12 months. And again, that goes back to our, this is really important to know because uh, we're the ones that are thinking about um, uh, whether to admit patients to intensive care. And things like frailty and increasing age, and increasing comorbidities because our ICU patient population is definitely changing. Certainly even in the last 10 years, definitely in the last 20 years, we now admit patients who are older, who are frailer, who have more multimorbidity than we would have done in the past. So we are admitting a cohort who are already at a lower baseline than previously. Um, obviously with all of these studies, there are limitations, and these are patient reported outcome measures, again, because it's all subjective, it's not an easy binary yes, no answer to them. Um, and there's likely to be um, an underestimation, because um, when they looked at the baseline, so there were more patients who they had the baseline um, studies at the time of ICU or just before ICU for the elective patients um, than completed the 12 months. And of the overall cohort that did the sort of initial questionnaires, actually their health status was worse than the ones who completed the 12 months. So this is likely to be an underestimation of new PICs. So it's definitely a problem. It's definitely really common that people get these problems, these new problems post-intensive care. And it's probably a growing problem because not only are we admitting more people to critical care, we're admitting people who are older, frailer and have more comorbidities. 
comorbidities uh, than we were 10 or 20 years ago. So let's talk a bit about the physical problems, and I'm going to concentrate a bit on ICU-acquired weakness, because this is one of the commonest, and it's one of the ones um, that most impacts on sort of um, quality of life and ability to get back to normal, if you like. Um, we could, I could talk all day about the other fatigue, pain and dyspnea, but I'm not going to because we've got quite a lot to get through. Uh, so I see acquired weakness. So this is like most of the problems after intensive care going to be multifactorial. And it's a mix of polyneuropathy, myopathy, neuromyopathy, and also just um, muscle deconditioning from often prolonged periods in bed and not exercising like they were before. Um, Lots of different studies looking at it. There is a massive um, spread of prevalence because it depends when you measure it, how you measure it, um, what you're looking for, and whether you're using surveys, whether you're using grip strength, whether you're using other things such as six-minute walk tests. Um, but overall, big meta-analysis um, done in the sort of mid uh, 2010s found about a 40% incidence. So. It's, that's quite high. So almost half of our patients have a degree of ICU acquired weakness. And interestingly, if you get, if you diagnose it by clinical means, so you're doing, you know, muscle strength testing on them, um, as compared to doing um, um, electrophysiological, so you're doing actual sort of you know, measuring testing, um, there's more problems um, if you look at these guys and test them electro using electrophysiological methods than actually if you're testing them using just clinical methods. So it's probably more, even more common than we think. Um, ICU acquired weakness increases the risk of death um, up to at least five years post ICU discharge. Um, you're more likely that the patients who are weak at discharge are more likely to die within those first five years than those that aren't. Um, and even really mild weakness, ICU discharge has been associated with um, an increased risk of death and reduced quality of life. Interestingly, um, there's lots of, there's more studies probably around ICU acquired weakness than there is around most of the other PICS problems, probably because it's easier to measure. Um, there's a better prognosis if it's predominantly muscle rather than nerve or nerve and muscle. Um, thinking about the physical problems, it's really difficult to know, and this is the case for a lot of PICS problems, is it related to what we do to them in intensive care, so invasive organ support? Now, for some things, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, things like tracheal stenosis following tracheostomy or prolonged intubation. We know that that happened because the tube was there. The tube was a necessary thing at the time because the patient needed ventilation. But if there hadn't been a tube there, there wouldn't be tracheal stenosis. But a lot of things, it's difficult to know, is it related to the underlying illness? Or is it a bit of a combination of two? Uh, things like muscle wasting and muscle weakness. We know in sepsis, you break down your muscles pretty quickly. So the actual sepsis that brought you into the intensive care unit might be the culprit, but potentially we are making things worse or certainly not making them better by what we're doing in critical care. Cognitive problems. So this is the bit that really scares me. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this paper. So this is the brain ICU study. Um, this was done in, uh, again, it's, a, it's relatively recent, it's 2007 to 2010, it's two large hospitals in Tennessee in the US, um, and it's a, it's a really interesting paper, and it's quite a big study for just two centres, and they looked at critical care adults, so over 18, and there was quite a sick cohort, so they needed to have um, shock or respiratory failure. So essentially over 90% were ventilated and most were on vasopressors. So quite an unwell cohort, definitely representing ICU or level three patients rather than HDU patients. Um, average age of 61 years. So again, that's pretty similar to our ICU cohorts. And they enrolled just over 820 patients. And what they did is that they uh, followed them up at three months and 12 months, and they got trained psychologists who had no idea of their, you know, what had happened in the intensive care unit to basically follow them up at that three and 12 month uh, period post discharge from ICU. And they ran um, a series of uh, essentially neuropsychological tests that look at cognition and all the different areas of cognition. So memory, executive function, processing, um, language and physiospatial uh, abilities. 
And they also did something called a trail making test. So again, that's looking at sort of overall cognition. And the really usefulness about those tests, so the, the neurocognitive test was called the R bands. I can't remember what that stands for now, sorry. Um, but it's one that can be repeated, that's what the R is. Um, and they have normal values for age um, and sex and education level. So they could actually compare these critical care survivors to what would be normal for patients who were matched to the same age, the same sex, and the same sort of final education level. And again, the results are pretty terrifying. So that at three months, 40% of patients had global cognition scores that were one and a half standard deviations what they below what they should have been um, from the sort of baseline scores. And that's equivalent to moderate traumatic brain injury. Um, a third of them, or just over that, 34% of them had scores that were two standard deviations below what would be expected. And that's the sort of brain injury or the sort of cognitive decline that we would expect with mild Alzheimer's disease. Um, at 12 months, it wasn't much better. So at 12 months, um, oh, I've not written that down. Uh, so essentially at 12 months, sorry, that is the 12 month scores. Um, so at 12 months, a third of patients had significant brain injury, had so significant brain injury for the brain ICU score. And they looked at younger patients. So it was like, well, is this just the old frail patients? Is this the ones who are going to you know, have problems underlying? Uh, so they looked at patients 49 years and under with no comorbidities at baseline. And they found in those patients at 12 months, a third of them had uh, cognition scores that were about the same as a moderate traumatic brain injury. And 20% so one in five had scores that were commensurate with mild Alzheimer's. And that's patients who were 49 years or less. Um, important to note that they actually didn't include any patients who had significant cognitive decline um, pre-existing critical care in, into this cohort. Um, the other thing that they pointed out was, so in Alzheimer's, uh, you generally get memory deficits. That's the major cognitive problem that you get. However, in the ICU survivors, they didn't just see memory deficits. They saw deficits in all the different areas of cognition. Um, so in a way, it's almost a worse brain injury than we would see with, with Alzheimer's. They also, quite interestingly, looked at sedation um, to see whether that had made an effect, and they couldn't really see an obvious um, correlation between different types of sedation, um, for example, benzos and opiates versus propofol or um, the alpha-2 agonists. Um, but what they then they also looked at delirium and they showed very consistently um, at three months and 12 months, those cognition scores were much worse in the patients who had longer delirium. So definitely being delirious is bad for your brain, but actually critical care itself irrespective of the reason that you come in, if you're really sick, it's definitely bad for your brain. What about the psychological problems? Again, this massively depends on what instruments you're using to test it, when you follow up the patient. So there are really wide prevalence um, of the different, uh, of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress that are recorded in the literature. Um, but they've done sort of big meta-analyses on these three areas, and they found that depression is about just over one in four of all of our critical care survivors. More than one in three are suffering significant anxiety, post-critical care, and then post-traumatic stress disorder, which we think about with you know, soldiers who've gone to war, people who've been kept captive. But if you go back to what I was saying at the beginning and trying to put yourself in the shoes of an intensive care patient who wakes up unable to speak, unable to communicate, possibly unable to move, everything hurts a little bit, there's alarms going off, you don't really know where you are, you don't really know what's going on, you may well be delirious and having hallucinations and, and really unpleasant dreams. That overall scores are about one in 20. Um, there are ways of managing psychological problems. It's about making sure your patient has got access to these. And this can be from the really simple, so the sort of trauma counselling, um, up to things like cognitive behavioural therapy or even something called EMDR, eye movement desensitisation and reprogramming, which is essentially relearning your, your retraining your brain to remember the things that have happened to you 
but not to sort of take you viscerally back to how you felt at the time. Because that's what happens in post-traumatic stress disorder. People get um, flashbacks to their time in intensive care. And rather than sort of having that flashback and going, yeah, that was pretty awful. I was really ill. I've got better. Things are looking up. What they they get is the sort of sympathetic reaction to what happened at the time. So they'll get uh, palpitations. They'll feel short of breath. They'll get very frightened. They get basically a sympathetic surge. So their their brain sort of viscerally takes them back to how they were feeling when they were that ill. Um, post traumatic stress disorder of that rate, so 20% or it's about 22% actually overall. Um, that is at the same level that combat veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan and US veterans um, experience. So this is significant. You know, this, is, this is what people who've been to war get after being to war. Um, this is what's happening in our critical care survivors. And, and often uh, my experience with the follow-up clinic is that patients are reluctant to talk about their psychological problems partly because their families have seen them survive critical illness. So they say, isn't it wonderful? You survived. You must be so grateful. And of course, they are grateful, but they don't, you know, but, but they are suffering. They're suffering mentally. So there's almost this kind of guilt. I can't tell people that I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I'm getting these awful flashbacks and I can't walk into a hospital because I, you know, it, I'm in cold sweat and my, my heart rate is pounding as soon as I walk through the door. Um, because they don't want to upset their families who've already been through a lot. And particularly, not, not so much, but particularly it's, you know, seen as something that isn't quite the same as physical health. Um, I think a bit of an overgeneralisation, but women are better at admitting to psychological problems maybe than, than men. And that's certainly something that I've seen in my follow-up clinics that they just don't want to talk about it because it's not something that they think should be affecting them. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder obviously is a real problem because one of the ways that people deal with it is by just avoiding things that trigger those memories and that might mean not engaging with healthcare in the future when they need it because every time they walk into a hospital they get that those awful sort of panicky feelings back again so it's really important to detect and it's really important to get these patients um, the help that they need so it's a problem. It's quite worrying. It definitely exists. Can we modify it? Well, yes and no. There are things that we can do in our daily practice that can help. There's stuff that we can't help. So we cannot help what our patients were like before they came to us. We can't change what their um, age was or whether they were frail. We can't really modify before they come to the intensive care unit and are in our care what their disease severity is, because all of these things are generally worse if you're older, frailer patients who have more comorbidities and who've got a higher severity of illness. We can't really do anything about that. What we can do is try and um, improve our acute management of them. We know that physical problems are worse in patients who need to be in intensive care for longer. So the sooner we can get them better out of intensive care, the better. Um, and that also includes trying to get them off a ventilator earlier. We know that certain drugs have been associated with increased weakness um, post-intensive care. So those might include the neuromuscular blockers. Those might include steroids, although there's actually some interesting data that shows that steroids may protect against some of the cognitive problems. So like most things, there's pros and there's cons. Really early feeding may be um, associated with greater muscle breakdown and greater weakness. And I think that that's something that we all need to think about. For example, when we're starting kind of early TPN, actually, can we wait a bit? The patient probably can't use all of those calories at this time. Um, you'll notice that delirium pitches up in all of these things because delirium has been associated with increasing PIC symptoms in all the different domains. We've talked a bit about the cognitive domain, but it's also from the physical domain and the psychological domain. From the cognitive point of view, much of it is just good intensive care so we can avoid sort of um, hypoxia and hyperoxia if we can keep their glucose relatively normal, which we do anyway, that's good intensive care. And then sedation, so minimizing sedation using sedation judiciously, but treating pain. Um, 
psychologically again same so trying to detect and manage delirium trying to minimize delirium trying to make all of those uh, things that we do on a daily basis so you know acceptable gases acceptable glucose levels um, and again trying to minimize sedation but using enough analgesics that our patients aren't in pain you might have all heard of the A, well, the A to, to S bundle, but actually now it's an A to H bundle. Uh, and this is basically a bundle of things that we can do in intensive care that um, try to not only get patients out of intensive care and off ventilators more quickly, um, but also to try and reduce some of the longer term problems. And the A to H uh, bundle, if you can't read it, it might be a bit small. So the A is um, analgesia to assess, prevent and manage pain. B is both spontaneous breathing and spontaneous awake trials, so that's our sedation holds or our sedation reduction um, and trying to get the patient's breathing. C is choice of analgesia and sedation. Um, we know that delirium is associated with greater benzo use and certainly benzo and opiate withdrawal can be associated with and um, can, can trigger delirium. So if we can minimize those drugs, sometimes we can't, you know, intensive care is always about doing the kind of least worst thing to our patients. It's always a bit of a balance. Um, but just to at least think about the sedation that we're using and try and minimize it. D is for delirium. I've talked a lot about delirium. Delirium is really important. What we can do with delirium is um, detect it, CAM ICU scoring, for example. We can pry, try and prevent it. So all of those simple things like um, trying to make sure our patients get sensible sleep, so using a night bundle, trying to make trying to get their day-night cycle sort of back to normal if that if that they can see out of a window, or having the lights down at night and the lights on in the in the day, keeping the noise down at night. Um, making sure they've got their glasses, their hearing aids, making sure that they can see a clock, making sure that every time you talk to them, you say who you are, what the day is, what the time is, what's going on with them. Um, I also, every time that I assess a patient, I go through all the lines that they're in, however unconscious they are. I'll sort of say, you know, you've got a breathing tube in, you won't be able to talk to me, but that's helping with your breathing. You've got a catheter in your bladder, so you can have a wee without worrying about it. I think particularly talking about things like bowel management systems, um, because again, that's a balloon at the bottom. That's a lot of people after intensive care sadly think that they've been abused when they've been in a coma. And that's probably related to catheters and bowel management systems. Um, we need to manage delirium. Ideally, non-pharmacologically, sometimes we do need to use drugs, but we know that no drugs are better than others. And a lot of drugs um, just pushes, like kicks the can down the road. So the delirium just happens a, a few hours or a few days later. The E of the A to um, S bundle is early mobility and exercise. Um, again, the jury's out a little bit on this. There are some papers, or there was a paper quite recently showing that we probably shouldn't do it too much too early, but certainly, um, trying to get our patients mobilized as much as possible and that helps with sleep and that helps reduce delirium. F is for family, so family engagement and empowerment. G, which is sort of an added one on, is good communication. I mean that kind of goes for all bits of healthcare really. And then H is handout materials. That stuff that the family or the patient can take home, um, can read sort of, you know, at their leisure that tells them about what to look for, what to expect, how to help. And then all these things on the right-hand side of my diagram are the sort of things that happen after they've gone from the hospital, so things that happen post-discharge. So emotional support, managing psychiatric symptoms, nutritional advice, sleep advice, rehab. I don't know if anyone has read this. So Michael Rosen, who is the children's author, who's a bit of a hero of mine, big, staunch um, supporter of the NHS even before he got ill, uh, got really ill with COVID, was ventilated on one of the London ICUs for a long time. And it was you know, reading reading and hearing from his, hearing his story, it was pretty touch and go about whether he would survive. And he's written this book about the time that he um, had COVID and was in intensive care. And he talks about his ICU diaries um, and he talks about how uplifting it was reading his diaries and understanding that people cared for him when he was essentially unconscious and can't remember anything. And um, they filled in the gap. And I see diaries. I'll talk a little bit about them in a bit. 
um, because they're also really important, might just seem like another thing to do, but to the patients, they're, they're really vital. Touch on PICS family or PICS S, and this is a bit of a can of worms. This isn't something that I often address in my follow-up clinics because we simply don't have the resources to support the families you know, we, we barely in the NHS have the resources to support the patients from an ICU rehab and follow up point of view. Um, but there are lots of problems, and these are all sort of related to mental health, of actually being not the person in the bed with all the tubes and lines coming out, but being the person who sits and watches their loved one uh, survive or not survive a critical illness. And actually, they have significant, families have significant elements of depression or anxiety and post traumatic um, stress. And for the patient, sorry, for the families who, uh, whose relatives die in intensive care, there's often quite complicated grief reactions afterwards. The way that I address it in my intensive care follow-up clinics is that I talk about psychological problems, post-intensive care. I say, you know, these are just as common as physical problems. They can significantly hamper your um, recovery. And actually, there are ways of treating them. There are ways of managing them. And I refer all the patients on to um, a trauma counselling service, there's something called the IAPT, which is um, present everywhere and is, is available all throughout the UK, well, all throughout England, um, and I think now Wales and Scotland, I'm not sure about Northern Ireland, and it stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, and they're essentially talking therapies, and patients can self-refer, they can do it online if they don't want to pick up the phone and speak to someone, or they can do it by telephone if they're, you know, not internet savvy. Um, and the way that I always put it is when I'm talking to patients and their relatives, I say, you know, this is a service for anyone and for anyone over 16 and anyone in the family or any friends that just need to want to talk things through with a counsellor, they can access it. So there is support available and there's been that's been increasing in recent years. And certainly there's got to be some silver linings of COVID, the sort of ICU follow up and things like the IAP service have really taken off. Uh, particularly post-COVID. So how are we doing for time? Okay, we've got a bit of time. So I've talked to you a little bit about the stuff that I've learned from my patients in follow-up. So when they talk about their time in intensive care and people talk about the hallucinations and nightmares that they experience um, while they're in intensive care, it's, it's a real eye-opener. And I think that it will... It certainly has taught me to be more patient, particularly with the sort of delirious level two patients who are desperately trying to pull things out and are really paranoid. Um, when people talk about their night and they talk about them as hallucinations, they feel that they're very real. They're often really in depth and patients see really scary stuff. Quite a lot of them think they're dead. Quite a lot of them see, you know, um, for example, their family being harmed in front of them. Um, a lot of people think that they're on boats, which I suspect is our pressure relieving mattress. Um, and some people, more than more than one person has told me that they, they thought they were on the Titanic and it was sinking. Um, when you get sort of frustrated because your patient is continuously trying to get out of bed, but then you listen to what they actually thought was happening, which was that they were in fear for their life and they were trying to run away from their kidnappers or they thought that they were being held captive and experimented on, um, then you can sort of understand why patients not only are trying to get out of bed are trying to pull out all their lines because they think they're not safe, they think their life's in danger. And I do wonder whether when you are critically ill essentially that is life-threatening and your brain goes into self-defense mode and that's where the paranoia comes from it's like you know i am at risk here my life is at risk and every time if you think about it also every time we go near an intensive care patient we are either poking and prodding and examining them we are putting lines in them maybe um you know the nurses will be changing position rolling them um um suctioning them all of those things are uncomfortable. You know, every single, if you've been in bed just for a few days with the flu, everything's a bit achy or everything, all your joints just feel a bit sore. Everything just feels a bit achy. Um, you talk to patients about suctioning and obviously these are soft suction catheters that go down an EP tube, but our tracheas are not designed to be poked even with soft catheters. 
And what patients describe is it burns when the suction catheter goes down. And especially for patients who are maybe being ventilated for respiratory failure, what you then do is suck all the, lung, the air out of their lungs. So they said, you know, people kept coming towards them, giving them this horrible sort of burning pain that made them cough, which really hurt. And then they felt like all the air in their lungs was taken out, which is essentially what we're doing when we're suctioning them. So it's also about explaining to your patients every time you do it, sorry, I know this is uncomfortable. I've got to help you cough up the stuff that's on your lungs. It might scratch when it goes down. It'll be over really quickly. And, and I'm sorry that, that it's uncomfortable. Um, also thinking if they're on short acting analgesia, to just give them a little boost before you do painful stuff like putting in noise and, and suctioning. Um, patients talk about how impossible it is to sleep. There are a few studies looking at sleep in ICU. Um, there's an Australian study where they got sleep um, physiologists into the ICU and they sort of tried to monitor people's sleep. And it's, it's difficult because sedation and sleep are not the same thing. But for the patients who weren't sedated, the average length of time that they slept for was 20 minutes. Imagine if you are somewhere where you can only get 20 minutes sleep at a time before you're woken up. And you're either woken up by the alarms on your, vent on your monitor going off or something sore happens or someone else's alarms go off or just there's people talking because, you know, we're a 24-7 service and we have to admit patients in the middle of the night and we have to communicate with each other. So it's just worth remembering that if we can do everything that we can to in improve or promote sleep at night for our patients, that's really important. Um, communication and language, patients talk about how frustrating it is not being able to communicate. And often when you put the speaking valve on for the first time and finally they can communicate, they say what a relief that is. Because they're essentially asking for things that, and you, we try, but we're actually quite difficult. We're quite bad at lip reading. Um, and so trying to get your patients to communicate, try and use letter boards, see if they can write, um, take time to try and understand what they're saying. Um, first is a big thing that people remember. And actually, if you think about it, a lot of our patients in intensive care are hypernatremic. Um, you know, if you have an acute kidney injury and that's recovering, your kidneys um, get the ability to pee out water much more quickly than they do sodium. And almost all of them end up hypernatremic at some point in the sort of AKI recovery period. And that will make you, if you're hypernatremic, your hypothalamus will be screaming at you, you're thirsty, you need to drink some water. And yet they've got a tube in. And we're not even we're not allowing them to drink water. And that feels like torture to a lot of our patients. Also, a lot of the medicines that we give are sodium based. We give a lot of sodium to our patients. So just keep an eye on their sodium levels. Um, that paralysis, that's really frightening for our patients when they first wake up if they're very weak. So, again, talk to your patients, say you've been in intensive care, you're on the mend now. Everything will feel really weak. That's because of the because of the illness. You are not paralyzed. This will get better. It will take time. And keep saying that. Say that every time that you see them. They won't retain a lot of information. Um, and particularly in COVID, this was something that I got told a lot in follow-up. Everyone around me was dying, which in a way was true. And there's not a way that we can take that away. But remember the other patients around the patient that you've just tried to resuscitate or who is, you know, severely ill. Remember what they can hear, what you're saying, those those curtains around the bed are not in any way soundproof. Um, the sorts of things that my patients talk about post-op, so there's a lot of musculoskeletal problems. There's quite a lot of um, nerve palsies, quite often have foot drop. Um, lots of the patients that were prone in COVID had shoulder problems, some of them quite severe needing, you know, sort of um, um, surgery and keyhole surgery and things. Um, we start loads of medications in ICU and then we don't stop them all. Um, and they go to the ward and the ward doctors think, oh, God, well, these are started in intensive care, so they must be really important. And they carry them on. And quite often at six months, I'm seeing patients who are still on um, benzodiazepines, who are still on amlodipine, which is, you know, the ICU antihypertensive of choice that doesn't really work. But no one stops it because they worry that it's an ICU medication. It's really important. Um, so do please wean down and stop or, or always give a plan for the patients who go out on ICU medications of what should happen to them on the ward. Um, swallowing often is fine by six months, but a lot of people get like weird things with their taste buds where everything tastes salty or everything tastes metallic. So, again, just warn people of that. Um, 
a lot of patients lose their hair. So our hair grows in three month cycles. And when you're really ill, when you're critically ill, your body um, entirely sends all its energy to the stuff that it really needs to keep alive. So your brain, your heart, uh, your liver, your lungs, your kidneys. What it doesn't send any energy to is your skin, your nails and your hair. And actually the skin of our patients often just peels off because it um, overturns um, really quickly. So your skin regenerates really quickly. Uh, patients can have ridges on their nails or their nails can entirely fall out. But then because our hair grows in three month cycles, the hair follicles go into hibernation when people are critically ill. And it's often three months later. So it's when they're in that recovery phase and they're back at home and everything's starting to get back to normal, they then get quite marked alopecia. And it's just to let them know that that happens. It might all, you know, a lot of it might come out, but it will come back. The hair follicles aren't dead. They're just hibernating. They just have to wait and give time um, to see if, um, and, and the hair often comes back. Sometimes it comes back an entirely different color and an entirely different texture, um, which is weird, can't really explain that. Um, but I sometimes see patients at six months who have spent loads of money on really expensive shampoos where actually what they need to do is just wait and it will come back. A lot of patients have survivor guilt. Um, quite a lot of patients can get quite agoraphobic, especially if it's an emergency admission, especially for an infectious disease, because they're like, I don't want to catch anything ever again. And you have to sort of help them balance that being sensible and looking after themselves while they're in the recovery phase, but also getting on with their life because, you know, we all have lives to lead. And finally about the diaries. So um, diaries have been shown in a randomised controlled trial. I'm sorry, I haven't put the... Um, I haven't um, put the reference on here, but they have been shown in a randomised controlled trial to reduce the incidence of uh, new PTSD post ICU. So not only are they something that the patients really cherish, and Michael Rosen talks about it in his book, and um, patients uh, find them really, really um, valuable resource to fill in the gaps in their memory, but actually they are they have been proven to reduce post traumatic stress disorder. So they really are really important, and I would urge you to write in the diaries so we've got to the end we've really quickly covered what it is how common it is why it's important both to our patients and to us as healthcare workers some things about um, how to minimize ticks so talking about that a to g bundle um, and some of the things that we look for in our follow-up clinics and how we can kind of um, help those patients moving forward and then finally, I've talked a little bit about what I've learned from my patients and how that has changed my practice and how I communicate with them and um, what I explain to them. Um, and hopefully that makes the ICU a bit more of a human, humanised place for our, for our patients. Does anyone have any questions? I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Kat. That was really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Thea. I'm one of the HCCS anaesthetic trainees at LRI. Uh, I've pre-digested this uh, journal uh, paper and will be running through a quick look over what it means for us as ITU clinicians. Um, this is a, based on a paper that came out last year in about May. Uh, mainly from French ITUs, based around the use of uh, IV hydrocortisone in severe community acquired pneumonia. So this is what the paper looks like from the New England Journal. Um, it's based around the idea that for quite a while now, although community acquired pneumonia is a significant burden in terms of uh, ITU entrance, in terms of admissions and mortality, uh, treatment-wise, we haven't really generated anything over the past few decades that has really moved the needle in terms of survival rates. Um, William also referred to pneumonia as the captain of the men of death, which I think is a very eloquent way of putting it. Uh, we know that this has been a problem for centuries um, and that we haven't really, uh, bar antibiotics and ventilation, got much that can change the trajectory for a lot of these patients. There's been various different studies in various different ITUs around the world using different kinds of steroids at different time points uh, in an attempt to see if that impacts survival at all. And that was really the aim of this study was to see whether 
early hydrocortisone specifically can be used to alter disease trajectory. But for the physiology of community acquired pneumonia, we know there's various different infectious agents as well as non infectious agents such as aspiration pneumonia. And there's a complex interplay between the infectious agents itself and the inflammatory response uh, and the immune response as well. So things like uh, pants and damps interacting to cause inflammation, driving issues with gas exchange, uh, systemic symptoms. And the use of steroids in this capacity would be really an immunomodulatory capacity because we know that. Uh, certain group of corticoid receptors are involved in things like nf cap b signaling and can switch on and off genes in the immune system and the aim here would be to see if early alterations in those would impact uh why hydrocortisone it's a really good question and the study really doesn't elucidate why they picked hydrocortisone over much else uh previous studies have used lots of different things there was a study probably the year before from the states that used methyl prep that uh, showed unequivocal, well, sorry, didn't show equivocal, showed equivocal results between patients who received methyl pred versus non methyl pred in ITU for community acquired pneumonia. I'm not, I can't, haven't managed to pierce together, piece together exactly why this group decided to use hydrocortisone, but they did. Um, so, yeah, I've used the CAS framework um, so that we've got clear kind of questions to answer on each slide. Um, I've tried to make it as least slide karaoke as possible. So, yeah. Uh, the null hypothesis for this was the addition of hydrocortisone to patients with severe community acquired pneumonia does not change the probability of death at day 28. Um, and they defined severe uh, by these four different things. So, initiation of mechanical ventilation, which is said as invasive or non invasive with a minimum of PP5, initiation of hypogonated oxygen with uh, PAO2 gradients. Um, patients wearing a non rebreathe mask or a score greater than 130 on the pulmonary severity index, which is made up of several different patients. I think it's worth talking about the study A here, which is very clear, but often I think death in ITU is a very difficult question to answer as to whether your treatment has, moved, has actually impacted that, because we know so many of our patients are unwell that actually using death as a binary measure is very difficult, but we'll keep that. The inclusion criteria, uh, just before we move on to the exclusion criteria, was fairly straightforward. Uh, they wanted people who were over 18, uh, had a social security number from France, um, weren't on any uh, um, kind of work, hadn't been initiated on much stuff beforehand. The exclusion criteria, the main stuff they focused on was a do not intubate, intubate form, uh, the presence of influenza and the presence of septic shock. There was a few other things about not having more than five days worth of antibiotics beforehand or not being on steroids prior to hospital admission. Uh, the intervention here was hydrocortisone, uh, and in this double blind study, they used saline as the uh, other intervention. The dosing for hydrocortisone was on four or eight days. They wanted to initiate it within 24 hours of the patient developing those pre mentioned severity criteria. Um, and the choice of four or eight days was decided by the clinical team, roughly based around whether they would have, whether they thought the patient was likely to be extubated within or move off ventilation within the next 48 hours. So there was a degree of clinical subjectivity about whether these patients got four or eight days of hydrocortisone. The assignment of, of participants was randomised. They used the computer system one-to-one -one ratio to make sure that um, patients were randomly allocated to each group. Uh, they did account for all the studies who and uh, for all the participants who entered. Um, those who were lost to follow up or um, were cast out were counted as dead for the uh, binary conclusions. Um, they screened, I think, 5,300 people and ended up with 400 in each group. Uh, one died in one group and a few others were found to have legal orders and they couldn't take, couldn't participate in the research. Uh, the participants were blind to the intervention they were giving. The investigators, in theory, were blind to the intervention they were giving. So, in theory, these the clinicians 
did not know whether they were giving hydrocortisone or normal saline. However, I think given that one of the things that was measured was uh, as a secondary outcome, uh, insulin use and weight gain, it is, that may well have altered how blind clinicians were. The people assessing the outcomes were blinded to the participants and the results. In terms of the groups, uh, they seem to be fairly closely matched, uh, slightly on the older side, um, predominance of male patients, more patients with COPD. Um, in terms of the actual kind of patient characteristics, don't have anything on ethnicity, which we'll come back to later because I think it is relevant. Um, but we know that in terms of the, the patients that entered this study, they were fairly well split between the two arms. The effects of the intervention were reported comprehensively. They had a primary outcome, which was death. Um, yeah, let's take a um, In the day 28, uh, death had occurred in 25 of the patients in the hydrocortisone group and 47 of the 395 in the uh, placebo group. Uh, so 6.2% in the hydrocort and 11.9% in the um, placebo group. The p-value for the difference between these and a tri-square test was uh, 0.06. They used a lot of secondary outcomes. Um, so death from any cause at day 90, the length of the ITU day, NIV intubation amongst patients who weren't originally receiving any, intubation for NIV at baseline, any vasopressor use at day 28, uh, ventilator and base press every day, uh, PAO2 ratios and sofa score changes a week, and quality of life day 90. Um, the secondary outcomes I think are particularly weak because they were very, very large, very vague, used as exploratory stuff and not accounted for the need to multiplicity. Um, and then I think the final really important question and kind of what I'm hoping to ask some debate is about whether this is relevant for patients in UHL. Um, I think this study has a lot going for it. It's a very well powered study. So they, they originally thought that their mortality rate from pneumonia would be significantly higher. So put more patients in than they would have needed. Um, I think it's a well designed study. Um, and I think it probably survives so it probably provides some pretty good evidence that in the patient group that underwent the study, there was some benefits from having early IV, IV hydrocortisone. However, there's a lot of questions about who we see in the ITU who might not fit what this patient group was. So immunocompromised patients, I don't think were involved in this. Um, about half of the patients didn't actually have a, an organism identified. Um, and ultimately, we they ruled out patients with septic shock on the proviso that the role of the steroids in that is slightly different. And to come back to a previous point about ethnicity, I think it does matter because we know that Leicester is a very diverse city and that we have lots of different people from lots of different areas of the world. And I don't know if that was the same makeup of the French study or the kind of French people that were undergoing this because they needed to have a French social security number. And I'm not sure whether that accurately reflects the diversity of our local populace and if that influences anything. So yeah, I mean, the overall study, the overall take home headline from this is that we've got a double blind phase three trial of hydrocortisone early within a day or so of requiring ventilatory or non-invasive support for severe pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, uh, excluding patients with septic shock or influenza. And in this French group, it seems to suggest that that provided a mortality mortality benefit at day 38. Um, the trial stopped early due to uh, interim analysis for adequately met safety goals and that it was had um, successfully cleared its kind of baseline for stopping early on behalf of a beneficial outcome. Um, so yeah, I, I think the question is, 
would this be something that we should be adding to patients who are coming up to the ITU um, with community acquired pneumonia? Appreciate if anybody's got any thoughts on that. Just curious <clears throat> how many people with an allergy in the complex ITU with that subsection. You know, that's a very specific group of people. Well, yeah, like what exposure should they live? What about that population? Without immediate need to go to the We can't go and let's not go to the bed. There are make meta analysis on this, and there is really good evidence that steroids have seen pneumonia that prevents the remodeling from cancer disease. Same thing with COVID, though. I think I'm much sure that's as clear cut. I think there's some matter analysis on that, but I know the initial. Uh, Red Cap study was very good in providing evidence for that, but I'm not sure about the long term results of that. Uh, there are lots of randomized control trials, and there are different meta analysis systems dealing with this topic. And then, yeah, they are good. They have continued in some states, not benefit, but the majority of studies they have taken. This is probably the largest and best quality study looking at yeah. IV hydrocort in that. Patient group, but I hear your point about actually a lot of these patients never even make it to ITU, not because they're too unwell to, but those perceptive shock ones obviously too uh, would come up to us, but would we need candidates for this? But because often we deliver the sort of ventilation that they're talking about here in wards outside of the ITU scenario. It's a really meaningful study. Yeah, it's So what do you think, Theo? Are you going to change your practice? Uh, that's, I mean, that's the, the million franc question. Um, I, I think it's it's really, it's a really good study. Um, I went in very skeptical on it. I think it's a really good study. I think it's probably, I, don't, I wouldn't change my practice on the basis of one paper, but I would really like to see if this becomes a standard of care. And I think it probably will. I think the evidence suggests from this study that there is a benefit for these patients getting early IV hydrocortisone, but within the parameters of this study. Is that the dose side? Yeah, it's like it's on the chain. I think it's 400. 200. It's 200. Thank you. Sorry, it's 200. I'm getting myself mixed up. 200 out of the four. 200 in future, or is it because that three doses? Or? In future. In future. Yeah, there is lots of meta analysis in the literature on this topic, and this is what everyone is doing studies on this. What do you guys think? Yes, no, maybe. Was the health statistic yesterday? It was. It was. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, can it be given in lawless? Because they are usually on the law of infusions already. So if you need another cannula or another life just to just give a hydrocot infusion, that's it. It's too much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And if you because actually it's like the same with the continuous bank infusions, isn't it? We know that plankomycin works best for continuous infusion because it's time above MIC that actually gives you the um, antimicrobial so the properties of that how bank works, but it ties up the line. So either yeah. you need a cannula or you need, and I think what we, we don't know, because I mean, this, this looks at infusions, so this is telling 
tricky though. I think that's really interesting. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's obviously something that's going to be a huge question ongoing, but even from this, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's steroids are very, in this setting, using these kind of immune modulators, so they're really broad. And you wonder if we can get more precise tools for knowing a what the actual inflammatory process is, and b being able to manipulate that. Will that change whether we use steroids or something else, or will that change the steroids we use? But that's a question for a different day, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I thought that was a really good presentation, David. Has anyone else got any questions for you? All right, guys, thanks very much. Have a Thank nice you. Weekend.